even if we fall, get back up. We'll be okay. You'll get us through it. Like we learned in Romans, you give us perseverance. You give us encouragement through your word. Pray, Lord, for Aiden and Lydia and being new parents and everything that comes with that. Um, sometimes just people trying to be helpful can be overwhelming. So I just pray that um, you'd give them wisdom and understanding to reach out for help as they need it, but just enjoy being parents. Just enjoy the baby and just everything that comes with that. And um, Having the opportunity um, to tell Jasper about Christ, to just um, read the Bible to him and show him the best way, the best life he can have. Pray, Lord, for Dad and just his pneumonia and um, keeps coming back and I know it has a lot to do with his COPD and other health issues. I just pray that you'd help him to recover and um, not get depressed over it, Father. Pray for Ricky Hasselbeck's box family and just the loss, only being like 56 years old, Lord, that um, I don't know if he was ready to meet you or where his family is at, but I just pray that you'd um, protect them and watch over them and comfort them and give Eddie the opportunity to talk to them. Pray, Lord, for Mike Paterna, and he's still um, the therapy and being able to walk. And um, we pray and thanks for um, he's, his depression is getting better. He's feeling better about himself and where he's at and what he can do. And that's a daily struggle. He's going to have his good days. He's going to have his bad days. So I just pray that you'd help him with that and help him um, depend upon Christ that can get him through all those things, Lord. Pray for John and Angela and their marriage and continue to grow in grace that forgiveness would come and that, Lord, that you would be honored and glorified in what you do and what you've done. Pray for Don Weitzel and his hip resurfacing, to help him with the pain, help him uh, start moving around and just being able to get back to normal. Pray that him and Shelly would ask for help if they need it. Um, like I said, we have a tendency not to ask for help. Pray for the Lord for our um, Sunday school class and our time together and just being able to get through Romans and all that you've taught us in here, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're in Romans chapter 15. We're going to finish that up, and we're going to get through 16, believe it or not. Um, that's my goal. Um, but I want to remind everybody, it's in verse 5 of 15. Now may the God who gives perseverance and encouragement grant to you the same mind with one accord according to Jesus Christ. And I was thinking about that, and I think I didn't spend enough time on that. And what I mean by that is, how are you able to have the mind of Christ? What do you have to do? I'm not going deep here, just throw it up. What do you have to read? You've got to read the Bible. Right. right. Not only you got to read it, you've got to do it. We have a lot of people who read through the Bible in a year. I have people that are lost that read through the Bible in a year. Okay, great. And they should read through the Bible because that's the only way they're going to fi find salvation. So I would never tell somebody that's lost, hey, don't read your Bible, that's dumb. That's where they're going to find life. But how do we know to mind to Christ if you're not reading your Bible? Spurgeon, I read a quote yesterday from Spurgeon, says, some of you have enough dust on your Bibles to write the word damnation on top of it. Because I will open my Bible when I come to Sunday school. I will open my Bible when I come to church. And then it becomes a bookshelf holder when we get home. I get on my kids about that. Are you reading your Bible? Are you praying? Are you walking your life? How are you going, like Pastor Luke said, how are you going to get wisdom if you don't read your Bible? So we run into this all the time, and we sometimes say to ourselves, boy, where did they come up with that? They didn't read their Bible. Remember the I feel statement? The person who goes, always says, I feel. It's not based on the Bible, just their feelings. I have my, a lot of people in my family, they are under the impression or the feeling that God is okay with people being homosexual. Is that based on the Bible? No. They will fight you tooth and nail over that. With no scriptural reference, no nothing. I'll be like, well, that's not God. That's not what God stands for. Well, that's just how I feel, and I think God will just forgive everybody. 
He will forgive everybody if you ask in faith. But you have to change. And you don't change before because you're wasting your time. You let the Holy Spirit change you. So as we go through this, keep this in mind. None of this stuff is, means anything if you're not going to read your Bible. You're not going to have... It's hard to be in a deacon meeting, not for us, because our deacons are getting along great, but it's hard to be in a deacon's meeting if not everybody's reading their Bible and understands what the Bible says. It gets rough. Because then all your, all your motives and all your actions and all your decisions are based on your experience and not based on the Word of God. You don't want that at a deacon board. You don't want that from your pastors. Anybody else want a pastor like, well, this is just, I just go off my experience. I'm be like, mm, how's that going to work for you? So as we go through this, we're going to start in verse 15. But I have written very boldly to you on some point so that is to remind you again because of the grace that was given to me from God. Anybody, did anybody question, I mean, he, Paul wrote a lot, didn't he? He's like, why well, vote very boldly? Yeah, we know, Paul. Let's see, the first three chapters, you sent us all to hell. You killed us all. But the whole time he's giving the gospel, the whole time he's telling us how to be better. What should we be doing? Why? Because of the grace that was given to me from God to be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering as a priest, the gospel of God, so that my offering of the Gentiles might become acceptable sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, Christ, Je Christ Jesus, I have found reason for boasting in things pertaining to God. Do you think Paul had a problem with his role? Do you think Paul knew his role? Yeah. So, so the Right. Well, I have written to you boldly, but just in case you miss it, uh, because of the grace you had get that was given to me from God, right? Right. He's like, listen, I'm going to say this stuff, but I'm going to remind you that it's all from God and none of it was from me, you know? Yeah. And, and, and literally, he hates the pride, you know? Yeah. He puts it aside and humbles himself. Yeah. It's okay to be prideful in God. I'm proud of God. Yeah, and that's what Paul's trying to tell you. My role, everything I am, all that I will ever be is because of God. I'm proud of that. Well, yep. Which is a great point. He, everybody understood their role. I don't have a problem throwing out seed if Steve doesn't have a problem watering. The problem comes in is when the waterer wants to be the seed thrower. Or the seed thrower doesn't want to throw any seed. See, if you don't know your role, or you're not happy with your role, or you're not doing your role, it hurts the church. And Paul's thrown out here, I have no problem with my role. Because who, of what? Because of Christ. I'm very happy where I'm at. I bet. He, he had the, the word of God in his hand tonight. If you think right. about how many times we've talked to somebody a spiritual matter and we gave them the truth and they got angry. Hmm. How many times has it happened? And then you say, to, what, what do you say to them? You say, don't be mad at me. Right. Be mad at God. Right. God is the one that said this. I brought up before, I showed the video. Be kind to me. I'm stuck with this. Like Alistair Begg said, this is all I got. This is my Lord. This is my master. What do you want me to say to you? And I think that's where people struggle. I mean, Jork and I were talking about it yesterday as we were driving to get some ice cream. <laughs> Truth is relative. We were passing by this church, and it said, um, what's it saying? The, uh, it's a, right on there. And what is it? A place for Christian dialogue. What does that even mean? Come in and give us your opinion? 
And then I told Jorg, I said, that means truth is relative. It's whatever I want to make it. This is where Pilate goes, what is truth? He didn't know. Actually, what Pilate might have been say, even saying is, I've never seen it. I deal with so many corrupt people. I deal with so many liars. I'm a liar. What is really truth? See how that all just keeps going south? And here's Paul. Paul, I know my role. And in 17, he says it perfect. What? Therefore, in Christ Jesus, I found reason for boasting. I'm allowed to boast about Christ. I'm allowed to tell people that I have a great God. Right. Bob, I would almost say that if you read 16, it says that I might. You put you there. Mm -hmm. Because whether you like it or not, that's the kind of a role that you've been given, right? That mm -hmm. I might be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. That's what mm -hmm. we do every day. Or what we should do every day. Right? right? So that's a role. Read that verse like it's you. Right. We all have a purpose. You're part of the body. You're not a hangnail. You're not. You guys want to get that? Or? <laughs> Elizabeth? <laughs> oh, thanks. And it says, I put down here, do you know your role and are you doing it? Are you doing what you're supposed to do? For I will not presume to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me, resulting in the obedience of the Gentiles by the word of God, by word and deed, in the power of signs and wonders, in the power of the Spirit, so that from Jerusalem around about as far as, uh, as far as Grafton, <laughs> I, I have fully preached, yeah, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. I think mean, I will presume to speak I'm not going to speak anything except what Christ have, has accomplished. I've heard people say, well, I, I just can't tell people about Christ. You don't remember how you got saved? You can't tell them what Christ has accomplished in your own life? Has he accomplished anything? Has he conquered your sin? Well, think about it. We've said it in Colossians because Paul wrote it. We've said it in Romans. Paul wrote it through the Holy Spirit. What? It's to change life. If your life's not changing, there's a problem. And I'm not talking about you moved an inch each year. That's, to me, uh, you're not working at it. Are you changing? Are you getting better? Are you moving forward? You can spend your whole life in Proverbs, honestly. Pastor Luke and I were talking about Proverbs addresses everything in life. We just don't like what it says sometimes. Go walk up to somebody and say, hey, if you get, seek wisdom, you're going to live. Oh, okay. Hey, but if you hate it, you're going to die. Now, Bobby can't say that. It's offensive. We've gotten very good of not offending people. We've gotten very good of not telling people the truth. Yeah. Because under the guise of don't be offensive, we just don't tell people the truth anymore. Um, you be ready to give an account of what? Of what Jesus Christ right. has done for you in your life. Paul right. was not afraid to do that. Right. What, are you, what are you telling them to be saved from if you don't tell somebody they're going to hell? Now, don't walk up to somebody and go, hey, you're going to hell. Yeah, that's not good. But you ever think about that? Do you think Paul had a problem preaching the gospel? Daily I contended with them in Jerusalem. Daily. Paul, I can just see Paul getting that limp, going to the temple. <laughs> but he wasn't going there to prove them wrong and say, hey, you're wrong and go home. He was actually going there to prove what? Who Christ was so they could do what? Respond. I want them to be saved. See, so we have to be careful. We can share a lot of knowledge with people just to be right. No, do you want them to be saved? Do you want them to come to Christ? Yes. That's the goal. And that was Paul's goal. For, who wants to read verses 20 through, and 21?
All right, great. What do you guys think of verse 20? It's great that I love how the Bible ties together because Paul makes that state to me, you know, pastor just preached on it. Yeah, that's a little pride issue there, don't you, Paul? What was it, what, who did Paul want to tell people? What type of person did Paul want to talk to? Somebody that didn't what? Yeah. I gotta, I'm going to be honest with you. If anybody has really gave people the gospel, I would almost, I prefer talking to people that have not heard the gospel. Has anybody ever run into that? What happens when you run into somebody that's heard the gospel over and over? Mm -hmm. What do you got, Pastor Luke? Yeah. Right. Yeah. I like that. That's a good point. What if they got a bad gospel? You're thinking, what's a bad gospel? The wrong one. Yeah. You didn't get them quite there. Or they think they're there and it's not right. That's even worse. What did Christ here in the wilderness when Satan went to him? Here, Satan gave him what? Just a little bit of the gospel. Yeah. So what do we run into when we meet somebody that's got just a little bit of the gospel? Yeah. But not all of them. Right. And then here you got Paul, and I like what Paul said. I aspired to preach the gospel, not where Christ was already named, so that I would not build on another man's foundation. Paul was an evangelist. This isn't talking about Paul the pastor. This is talking, and this isn't talking about our pastors from that sense. Pastors have a role, don't they? They build up the church. They bind up wounds. Why? This, listen, this, I posted it on my um, in Messenger. What? George's Messenger. <laughs> She's like, let's not get technical here. Okay. <laughs> tomato, tomato, you know what it is. But uh, let's see, there, where was it? Oh, here it is. It says, a church should be a camp of soldiers, not a hospital of invalids. I like when I put those on my, you know, small group, because then nobody responds to that one. They're like, ah. But will people get injured? Yep. Will people need bound up? Yep. Do they need dust it off? Yep. That's the pastor's role. What's an evangelist's role? To give the clear, truthful gospel, and that's what Paul was doing. Then Paul would do what? Set up churches, and he'd find men to be pastors. He'd find men to be deacons, and then what did it? That I gotta be honest with you, I love that role of Paul. I love that role of missionaries even today. There's different roles for missionaries. I get all that. But the missionary that I came to this town, I preached the gospel, I found men that could take over for me, we set up a deacon board, and now i got to get moving. Because I'm an evangelist. I'm not, I'm not that role, per se, of the pastor. I like giving the gospel. I like building up churches. And then you find men that can take over for you. You train men that can take over for you. And that's where Paul's at. I'm an evangelist. I, I can go and do that. Then they had no news of him shall see, and they who have not heard shall understand. You have to, if you have nothing to thank God for, then you definitely should be thanking him for that the Gentiles were allowed to be saved. And everybody said, What's it? who's a Gentile? And everybody, this is not a Jewish person. And they're very rigid. I, I work out east. We have some high Jewish um, populations out there. And it's kind of weird, like, it's a nice club. I've never had a Jewish person try to say, hey, do you know God? They're not evangelizing. Aren't they supposed to? Even if you're going to the Old, Old Testament, they should be doing that. Remember, they were supposed to draw people in. Hey, here's our God. What do we do? We go out. You can't stay at the church. You don't get to live here. You go out. 
You tell people about Christ, and you bring them in. And then our pastors take over their roles, our teachers take over their roles, and the ones that are comforters take over their roles. See how everybody starts taking care of the person that came into the church? We got a new members class coming. Sometimes we have a tendency, oh, we got new members, and then we don't do anything with them. That's not our role, that's Paul's role. Paul told them about Christ, and now they're at a church, and it's the church's time to take over their role. So let's not forget our role. It says, for this reason I have often prevented from coming to you, but now, with no further place for me in these regions, and since I have not had for many years a longing to come to you, or I've had a longing to come to you, whenever I go to Spain, for I hope to see you in passing, and to be helped on my way there by you, when I have first enjoyed your company for a while, but now I am going to Jerusalem serving the saints." Who kept keeping Paul from going to Rome? Yeah, the Holy Spirit. You go read it next. There's a couple times Paul tried to go to certain regions, and the Holy Spirit's like, yeah, you can't go there. Yep, that's for somebody else. Think about that. You're not allowed to go there. Paul had a role. He understood his role. He's like, okay, I'll just keep moving around. There's nothing wrong with that. You ever run into somebody you've been compelled to talk to? I have. You ever run into somebody that you talked to you had no intention of talking to? Isn't that great how the Holy Spirit does that? And this girl today, or Friday, she was really upset. She's in the office and everybody's walking around her. And I go, what's wrong with her? And they're like, oh, her mom's coming to pick up with her. She got some bad news. So I'm like, oh, okay. So I walk, I'm being Bob, so what's going on, Nadia? She's like, well, I just found out. Now, she's 20 years old. I just found out I have MS. Hmm. Okay. I go, how are you doing? She goes, I'm going to die. She goes, and my mom doesn't understand these panic attacks I started having, and she doesn't understand this, and I'm going to die. So then she brought the pastor over, and and the deacons over, and they did an exorcism on me because they say that's a, a, an exorcism. I'm like, oh, Lord. And they're like, I'm like, okay. I said, I go, um, you know, Elisha was depressed. She goes, that's what I told him. I said, okay. So I was able to start talking to her about God, gave her my phone number, said, I told her, I said, well, I used to have panic attacks. I can help you with those. I go, and Christ can help you with those. I said, has your mom ever had a panic attack? And she goes, no. I go, then she's not going to understand. She, no, I go, no. She keeps telling me, just get over it. A 20-year-old has MS. Does anybody know it needed to be told where, how that's going to end? She knows. And it's overwhelming her. I could have, let me tell you, I walked by her three times, and I'm like, okay, maybe she's not stop feeling good. And finally, who do you think poked me to go, so you going to say something to her? I'm going, I'm going. You ever get that? Like, you keep getting poked? Yeah. Yeah. The Holy Spirit's trying to motivate you to do your role, to tell you what to do. Paul wanted to come to them, but the Spirit prevented him. That's okay. Move in direct. But I guess I'd question this. What if you never tell anybody about Christ? I think it's better to be poked than thrown by a wind. That's true. <laughs> you got a free ride. You had to be a mess. I would have loved to see Jonah. When I see him in heaven, I'd be like, how'd you look, brother? I mean, you had whale acid. You, you had to be a train wreck. You probably scared those people walking into Nineveh. You had to be a mess. Yeah, that's a, see, we go back to um, the next couple of weeks, we're, we're not going to do a book study, we're going to go through, like Paul's saying, the Old Testament was written for your learning, we're going to go through short little Bible stories like that, what are we to learn from those, you know, thanks for bringing that up, Don, it's like, it's a classic example of our Bible, are you reading your Bible with purpose, and my thing is, I still remember Tim Mayo saying, I was listening to him preach, and this was years ago, and he said, 
somebody said to him, you know, he's preaching, well, can't you go deeper on that? He goes, if you can't just understand the first flyover, he goes, why would I go deeper? He goes, there's plenty just doing a casual read. And he goes, so if we can't catch what we're supposed to catch in our first casual read, why would you go any deeper? That just tells me you're not going to do whatever you find out deeper, you're not going to do. I still remember Pastor Brown, my first class I took with him, it was a big class, there were like 40 of us in there. You know, for an evening class, that was a lot of people. And uh, he says, do me a favor, if you were here to increase your Bible knowledge, he goes, please go home, I just, uh, you're not what I'm looking for. He goes, but if you're here to learn and then share that with other people, he goes, then you're in the right place. That's what we're supposed to be doing in church. What did I learn from the message today? What did I learn at Sunday school? Steve and Tara teach Sunday school and Jenny teach. There's plenty of teachers here. Is that our goal is how can I teach that in such a way that they'll share it with somebody? I think Paul was a great sharer. I think Paul had no problem sharing where he came from, where he's from, and what happened to him. He's on his way to Jerusalem to do what? He's got a gift for the poor in Jerusalem. Now, if you read Acts, you know that he's going to Jerusalem and the whole time he's being told what's going to happen to him. Yeah, you're, you're going to be in chains. Did he still go? Happily. Yes. Like, well, that's what Christ has for me. <laughs> we avoid things. We even pray for things like that, don't we? Like, Lord, don't let anything bad happen to me. Well, Bob, and I was just going to be like, yeah, well, let's keep going, but don't we get mad when we get told no sometimes? Mm -hmm. Like, it could be something good. Paul wanted to go tell people about Christ. And, and God said, nah, that's not, that's not you. You know, like, sometimes maybe we start a ministry here at church, and, and it doesn't work out, and we can get really upset about mm -hmm. that. Right. Right? Go back to prayer. What do you want me to do? Just jump back into that. And I'll chalk this as up, up as opinion. You can take it where you want. But if you start a ministry and it's going nowhere, you might want to rethink your ministry. That's Bob's opinion. It's not all opinion. But if God is moving you and directing you to a ministry, won't he bless it? If it's going nowhere, you have to make sure it's not your pride that's saying, hey, I want to do this, and I think this is what's needed. How many times have we heard a, a missionary who went to the field for some reason, and then their role changed, mm -hmm. right? Right. And, and they were fluid. They, they, they did what they were supposed to do. But we, don't, we think that we know all these things going in, like I'm planning for this and this and this and this, and God says, well, that's fine. It's fine that you're doing that, because you're going to actually be doing these other things. Right. 26, for, for Macedonia and Arcadia had been pleased to make a contribution to the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. Yes, they were pleased to do so, and they are indebted to them. For the Gentiles ha have shared in the, their spiritual things, they have also indebted to the minister them also in material things. Therefore, when I have finished this and have put my seal on the fruits of, their, of theirs, I will go on my way to Spain. I know that when I come to you, I will come in the fullness and the blessing of Christ." Paul was going to be a blessing to them. So now, you come to church. Are you a blessing to people? Am I blessed by Malia and Julia if they come to church? I should be. Just their presence blesses me. Julia's like, yeah, I know, thanks. Did you come to the first sermon, Malia? Okay, you'll find out that pride thing's got to go. But anyway... <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh, are you a blessing to somebody? When you come to church, did you help somebody? Or are you a taker? You ever run into a taker? Give me, give me, build me up, make me feel better. They take from people. They, they you ever had that person that just drains the life out of you? 
Like they take your energy. Are they try do you try to be a blessing? Do you try to help others? We should. I'm not saying you don't need. I'm just saying have a nice balance. If you don't know what a taker is, you should if you have children. They're takers. Can't, can't the kids you love the most sap the most life out of you? Like, man, that's just like draining the life out of me. Like, I'm like, sometimes I'm like, just your patience. You know what's amazing? Is the ones, the true Christians that need it the most are the ones you give it to. Yep. So you have a lot of people that will not tell you any of their problems. They're always helping somebody else. And you know they have problems. My kids get offended. Ella, out of all three of our children, was, is the least issues with all of them. Of course, they swear I'm down she didn't get hit enough when she was growing up. <laughs> and you would think we had beat our kids growing up their whole life. Nah, come on. Right. Yeah, it's always the young kids. I'm a middle child, so it's like, you're not going to tell me nothing. Middle child, I'm, my mom would forget my name half the time. I'm like, oh, you're the middle one, aren't you? Like, yep. The middle kids are rough. I know that when I come to you, I will come to you in the fullness of the blessing. Now I urge you, brethren, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit to strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. Pray for me, please. Help me. I got a lot on my hands. I'm giving the gospel. I'm going to be taken in change. Get, pray for me to be able to do all this. That I may be rescued from those who are disobedient in Judah and that my service for Jerusalem may prove acceptable to the saints. You remember that group of guys that took that oath that they wouldn't eat or drink until Paul was dead? They must be pretty thirsty. So Paul said those same type of people are still living in Judah. They still want him dead. So he's praying for their, he's asking us to pray for his protection, and we should be praying for our missionaries' protection. We assume sometimes when we send missionaries out that they're going to the United States, that type of protection. No. So that I may come to you in the joy by the will of God and find refreshing rest in your company. Now the God of peace be with all of you. I like this. So that I may come to you in joy by the will of God and find rest in your company. My safe place is church. And my house. I get up every morning saying, boy, I can't wait to get home. Because it's my safe place. When I go outside the door, it's, a, it's rough out there. Isn't it? Phone rings, life comes inside your safe place. Life's always attacking Hey, such and such needs a surgery. Such and su Ricky passed away. Don needed his hip um, resurfaced. Mike Petruna struggling walking. See how life comes in? Do we wonder why Paul said, please pray for me? See, don't pray for me if you don't think it's going to work, though. I mean, honestly, don't waste your time praying for somebody if you really think God isn't going to do anything about it. It's a waste of your time. It's a lack of your faith. And then you're really not helping any of us out because you have a lack of faith. Right? In chapter 16, skip down to verse 17, please. Now I urge you, brethren, keep your eyes on those who are caused dissensions, hindrances contrary to the teaching which you have learned, and turn away from them. I am, I am a huge person on this. Okay. I'll say it again. Where do false teachers come from? Yep, the inside. They live among us. They walk among us. They're friends with us. They're in our Sunday school classes. They're in our, in our churches. They might even be on boards. They'll probably be some of the nicest people you ever meet. Teaching people what's wrong. Teach, teaching them to be disobedient. And it'll be subtle things. It'll be little things. I don't know if the pastor's really right on that. Well, the Bible says that. Yeah, but 
You know, the Bible doesn't tell you everything. You know, there's that group of what, Galatia, that said they had the secret knowledge and everybody started falling for it? Well, I heard a pastor say one time, blah, blah, blah. I guess there's a pastor out there, John Taylor was telling me last week, that now says he has picked the date of Christ's return. The dude doesn't read his Bible. Somebody comes up to you and says, I know when Christ is returning, you should say, I got to go. I've always told my kids this. There's a couple things you gotta, you got to keep in mind every day you wake up and you go to work. One, crazy will show up today. Two, you will not know what crazy looks like. And then three, crazy will show up today. It's the same thing in here. There are some people that say some crazy things in here, and then some of, the, some of you are like, oh, yeah, I see your point. No, you, no. What point? Back to we don't want to offend. I'm looking at a book now. I'm just trying to figure out how to teach it, um, and it's called The Jesus Nobody Knows. And it's nine lessons on nine, thing, nine times where Christ went after the Pharisees. Did that make some of the hair raise up on the back of your necks? What do you mean Christ went after people? You do know that the Pharisees hated him, right? You do know that, listen, you don't walk into the temple flipping tables and people don't hate you. I tell you what, in the church, I could have flipped some tables in there. Sunday, on Sunday when we'd have uh, the Thanksgiving meal and I find, find out it's stovetop, Turkey's great, stovetop. You can only put so much gravy on that. It just keeps soaking it in. I don't know what the, I don't know what they've done to the breadcrumbs of stovetop. It just, it sucks the moisture out of everything. Like I tried making it one time, my spoon literally stood up in the middle of the pan. If you like stovetop, I'm sorry, um, you need to venture out, <laughs> find new things. But the thing about it is, false teachers they want, they want to be in charge. I think Pastor Hack mentioned it a couple weeks ago. They want people to listen to them. They want to be in charge. Why? Because they like that power. That is a pride issue. They're not trying to train you. They're not trying to teach you. They're not trying to help you. They want you to be attached to them. And if the pastor doesn't change his ways, sometimes they'll leave and take people with them. Paul's like, what does Paul say? Turn away from them. Go, leave them. Don't have anything to do with them. You're going to find like that, people like that in your church all the time. If you stop listening to them, they'll go away. Because they're going to move to a church that will listen. Does that make sense? For such men are slaves, not of our Lord Jesus Christ, but of their own appetites. By their smooth and flattering speech, they deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting. For the report of your obedience has reached to all. Therefore, I am rejoicing over you. But I want you to be wise in what is good and innocent what is in what is evil. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. But I want you to be wise in what is good and innocent in what is evil. How do you become innocent in what is evil? What's your thoughts on that? How about you don't, do you have to listen to everything somebody tells you? Right? <laughs> Very. Thank you. Marcy's like, and she'll pay for that later. <laughs> What's that? No, they're not up here. Go ahead. What do you got? <laughs> Think about it. Be innocent in what's evil. You don't have to watch everything that comes on TV. You don't have to read everything in the news. I don't need to read how the axe murderer tracked the woman down and did all these things to her, and then on and on and on. It's a whole big article. I don't, get it? Don't let that stuff rattle in your head. Be innocent. Like, I know what murder is. I don't need to be go into the graphic details of it. Right? Have enough wisdom to know that it's evil 
Right. So that you can stay away from it. Problem is, remember, is. our flesh is, remember, this old sin nature is attracted to it, wants to draw you in. How about being at work or even being at church? Oh, did you hear? Oh, here it comes. The gossip, backbiting, blah, blah, blah. I wonder what would happen if people just stopped saying, I don't care. You don't care about people? No, I don't care what you're going to gossip about. Those people would go away too. They like be, the one, it, there's a person that likes to be in the first one of the news. I got somebody like in our family like that. If somebody dies, she's got to be the first one to post it. Can you let everybody tell our family first before you post that some, one of our relatives passed away? Why did you got to be first? They like that role. They like that. They like being, that's a little, another form of control. Skip down to 25. Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which has been kept secret for long ages past, but now is manifest, and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandments of the eternal God, has been made known to all the nations, leading to obedience of faith. To the only wise God through Jesus Christ be glory forever. Now who, who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ? You know, Paul owned the gospel. It doesn't mean he came up with it. Some people throw this out. See, it was Paul's gospel. No. He owned it. He had no problems with it. It's my gospel. I own it. It's mine. I get to keep it. You should be sharing your pearl. I've said this before. You should be showing your pe the people you run into your poor pearl of great price. Can I have that? No, you can get your own now. Well, where do I get that? Well, let me show you my gospel. Isn't that cool? Like, you get to show them your pearl. Hey, my pearl. We didn't bury it. You're not supposed to bury it. Don't, it's for the young ones in here. According to the revelation of the mystery, which has been kept secret for long ages past, nobody saw the church coming. You didn't, I didn't, the Jews didn't, and it was never, I like when people say, well, the church is mentioned in the Old Testament. No, it isn't. The only person knew the church was coming was God. Period. It's a, it was a mystery. In ages past, God already knew the church was coming. The church and Israel are not the same. You cannot apply church passages to Israel, and you can't do the same thing with Israel and the church. They don't mix. There's certain passages that the Israelites are um, going to be fulfilled for them that has nothing to do with the church. It's okay. We're all going to the same place. Israel just has a special place in God's um, plan and in his heart. He picked them just like he picked you. So as we wrap up Romans, keep it in the forefront of your mind. When you're giving the gospel, what do you have to tell somebody? You're lost. Or, better yet, we're all lost. We're all going to hell. We're all not going to make it. It does not matter if you almost make it. It doesn't matter if you are trying to do the best you can you're still going to die and go to hell. Well, then what am I supposed to do? Then you introduce them to Christ. But if you're going to introduce somebody to Christ and not show them or tell them that he's God, you're leaving out a huge piece of the gospel. Because there's too many faiths out there now saying that Christ was just a man and he was just like the prophet Muhammad. He was just, just like Gandhi. He's just like everybody else that's come around. No, he's God. I told you before, the girl says, you know, I, can, I told her, I said, I can prove to you God loves, loves you because I'm going to show you the cross. So if somebody says, God doesn't love me, take him to the cross. You got to go there anyway. And if you're not taking the cross, what are you doing? You can't just tell them they're a sinner. You can't tell them who Christ is and then somehow not get rid of their sin. Look, we've been in Romans Paul did the whole gospel, did he not? He got, him, he got us through the whole thing. At some point, you've got to show him what Christ did. He's willing to take away your sin and give you his righteousness. 
What? All you got to do is believe. Now, notice I didn't say know, know this, believe this, accept it for true. Accept it when you're on your deathbed. Accept it when you're going through pain. Accept and hang on to it with all your life because that's all you have. Has anybody here yet not figured out that life's rough? I mean, it used to be worse when we were growing up. You know, you get that call in the middle of the night and, you know, that old phone ring. You're like, hey, nobody calls at 2 in the morning. And you, you know, your heart kind of seizes up because you're afraid of the news. You know, life shows up. But we have Christ, those who believe. You just took communion for some of you. If you truly believe who Christ is, that's all of Romans. What more could we ask for? So now share it with people. Listen, it says he gives you perseverance and he gives you encouragement. So if you want God to encourage you, you got to do what? Read your Bible. If you want God to reprimand you, read your Bible. If you need to get rid of your sin, read your Bible. If you need to get rid of our pride, I have a pride issue. I have to beat it down every day. I know who I am. I was prideful since I was little. I get it. I got to beat it down. Uh, trust me, Pastor Luke did not need to tell me that God hates pride. I got to work at it every day. But that's why we have our Bibles. I've enjoyed teaching Romans to you. Um, I know what June 13th, isn't it, Steve? We're going to break back into regular church and stuff. So we're still trying to figure out all the intricacy. I told Pastor I want to teach upstairs, but he's afraid the older women will kick me out. So we got to somehow figure that out. Yeah. See. See. <laughs> Tough crowd. There's always one. All right, we'll pray and then we'll go. Father, we're just so thankful for the body, how they encourage me, how they help me to be a better Christian. Um, their input, just them being here and encouraging me to teach and the Holy Spirit touching each one of us. Pray, Lord, as we get ready in June to um, go to one service and getting things a little back to normal, but let's not be normal about Christ. Let's start breaking out of this shell of we've become home buddies. We like the mask because it hides. We don't have to really interact. Don't have to be too friendly if I have a mask on. So I just pray that you'd help us to break out from this and help us to be who we are. That we can be Paul. Paul was just motivated by the Holy Spirit. The same Spirit that lives in us. We can all be that Paul where that is unashamed to present the gospel, is boastful in what Christ has done for him, and will share with everybody. Pray that you bless us through the rest of this week. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>